So chapter one is entitled The Central Science. Um, Chemistry is called the central science uh, because it really helps us to understand all of the other sciences. So biology, physics, geology, um, medicine, genetics, all sorts of other sciences require some understanding of chemistry. And that's one of the reasons we get so many people in chemistry class who don't like chemistry. It's like, well, hold up, but I want to study biology. Why are they making me take chemistry? because the chemistry is going to help you understand biology. Okay, so it, it's an important science. Um, chemistry is the study of matter and the changes that matter undergoes. So we'll be talking about what matter is and how to you know, measure different things about it and also how does matter change in chemical reactions or when ice melts and things like that. Okay, so here we've used this word matter. We need to understand what matter is. Matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. So when words are bolded here on the slides, um, those are words that we should understand the definitions of. I don't believe in requiring students to write out definitions of words, but you should review these and make sure that you understand what I mean when I'm saying matter, okay? Because matter is a word that's used in all kinds of different ways. You can say, what's the matter? Because somebody's crying, right? That's a different question than what is matter, right? So matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. Well, what are some examples of matter? The table, yeah. So the table, wait a minute. Having a problem. It's too soon to have problems. Okay, the table. The table is matter. How about the air? It takes up space, right? You can blow air into a balloon. We can see that it takes up space. Does air have mass? It does. We don't really think of it that way because we're just used to the atmosphere being around us, but there is atmospheric pressure weighing down on us. So the air around us is matter. How about my raspberry lemonade? Is that matter? Yeah. So anything that takes up space and has mass. What about, um, what about light? Light is a form of energy. Does energy have mass? No. Does energy have take up space? No. So there are things that are important that are not matter. Okay, so energy is not matter. How about an emotion like love or hate? Does that matter? No. Does it matter? <laughs> yeah, it does, right? But it's not matter. Okay. So we're studying things that have mass and take up space and the changes that happened to them. That's what chemistry is. So you probably already know a little bit of chemistry, even if you've never taken chemistry before. Um, you've probably heard of molecules. Molecules are teeny tiny pieces of matter. They're way too small to see. And the individual molecules are made up of atoms, which are the smallest particles of matter. So you've probably heard those terms, and we'll be talking more about them. Um, many familiar processes that we see in our everyday lives are actually chemical reactions. So we've got some pictures here. Here's a gas burner. You've got natural gas in the burner of the stove, and you, you spark it, and it, it burns and gives off heat. That's a chemical reaction. So we're familiar with chemical reactions. We just maybe haven't thought about them. Here's a barrel out in somebody's backyard rusting. When metal rusts, it's a reaction of the iron with oxygen to form iron oxide, and it's a chemical reaction. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is, right? Alka-Seltzer. You drop two Alka-Seltzer tablets in a cup of water, and it bubbles and fizzes. That's a chemical reaction. So we are familiar with chemical reactions. 
Um, we talk about a macroscopic level and a molecular level. Macroscopic, oh, well, I missed the italics on the M. See, I see those stupid things. Um, a macroscopic level, looking at something, is stuff you can see with your eyes. These are examples of things that we can observe directly with our eyes. There's also a microscopic level, which would require the use of a microscope. If you want to see the individual cells in the leaf of a plant, you'd have to use a microscope. They're too small for you to see with your eyes. But chemists look at a lot of things on the molecular level. So we're not physically looking, but we're studying and we're trying to understand on the level of those teeny, teeny, tiny particles. So that's what chemists do. What do molecules look like? Well, we, we can't really have pictures of molecules because they're too small. There's some really fancy um, electronic microscopes that can give us fuzzy images, um, but even those aren't really that accurate. We do believe that molecules, I'm sorry, that atoms are basically spherical. And so instead of getting worried about what an atom actually looks like, let's just represent atoms. And we tend to represent atoms um, with models. And two models that we use frequently are the ball and stick model or the space filling model. The ball and stick model um, shows each individual atom as a sphere or a ball. And when they're bonded together, they're connected with a stick. Hence the name ball and stick model. And this is very useful for visualizing. I don't know about you, but I am a very visual person. I need to be able to see something to remember and understand it. So how can I do chemistry with atoms and molecules that I can't see? I have pictures in my mind, right? We can draw pictures that represent what's going on. And we can learn to imagine what's going on and that's, uh, that's good enough, at least for me. So we use the balls and the sticks. The space filling model is probably a more accurate description of what that molecule um, would actually look like. This is a model of water, H2O. So we have one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. And here again, the one oxygen and the two hydrogens. It would actually look more like this. So, this is useful for some applications, and this is more useful for other applications. We tend to use color to indicate what kind of an atom the different atoms are. Um, and so these are the colors that are used in this book, and they're pretty standard. Hydrogen is generally represented as a white ball. Carbon is black. Oxygen is red, etc. You don't need to memorize that, but just be aware that the colors do have significance. Well, how do chemists study these things that they can't see? Um, we use what's called the scientific method. The scientific method is not a list of steps, do this, do this, do this. It's a general approach to learning something. And it can actually be applied to everyday life problems, right? Um, and so it, it's useful to learn even if you're not going to be a scientist. Um, so the scientific method is just a set of guidelines. So usually what happens first is that you make some observations. Um, you need some data. And the data can be just something that you noticed, or it could, be, um, it could involve numbers, but it's, it's some sort of an observation. You see something, okay? Um, the example given in your book was um, about smallpox. Um, Smallpox was an illness that used to kill a lot of people and horribly disfigure the ones that survived. Well, the observation was that milkmaids didn't get smallpox. So smallpox epidemic would come through a village. Lots of people got it. But the milkmaids, the girls that milked cows all the time, they didn't get smallpox. So that's an observation. Huh. Why is that? So the first is the observation. And, and sometimes we're looking for patterns or trends. And so this was a pattern that the milkmaids didn't get sick when everybody else got sick. So we noticed a pattern. 
Um, sometimes the observation of that pattern or trend um, is a law. And a scientific law is just a concise description of a reliable relationship between phenomena. Okay, that's a whole bunch of big words. What that means is we observe that if we do this one thing, something else always happens. Have you heard of the law of gravity? The law of gravity says that if I let go of this marker, what's going to happen? It's going to fall to the floor. It does that every semester. Just amazing, right? That's the law of gravity. It says what is going to happen. It's a relationship between phenomena. Okay, and so there are many laws. The laws just say what happens. If I do this, this will happen. Well, so we observe this thing and then we formulate a hypothesis because we don't want to know just what happens. We want to know why. That's where the real learning occurs. Why? So we formulate what's called a hypothesis. That's a tentative explanation for why. So the, tenet, the hypothesis about the milkmaids was there was another illness called cowpox that the milkmaids frequently got because they were in contact with cows so much. So the hypothesis was that because the milkmaids had already had cowpox, then somehow they were immune to smallpox. So that's a great idea, but we need proof of it. Okay? So you have a hypothesis based on your observations, and then that needs to be tested. The testing of it is the experiment. So you set up an experiment and you see what's going to happen. So in this experiment, and you can tell this was done hundreds of years ago because it would never be allowed now. So they, they found a milkmaid who had an active cowpox infection. So she had these like pustules right on her skin. And so they took some of the pus out of, out of her sores and put it under the skin of a little boy. Right? So they gave him cowpox, so he got cowpox, right? We'd never do anything like that now. All the stuff they used to do. So then, after he had recovered from cowpox, they exposed him to smallpox. Nice, right? But he didn't get smallpox. And so that was an experiment that confirmed the hypothesis. Because if he had gotten smallpox after having cowpox, that would mean that the hypothesis was wrong. And there must be some other reason why the, the milkmaids weren't getting smallpox. Does that make sense? Now, does that one experiment being true prove it for all time? No, because there could be some other factor that we're not aware of. So what scientists do is they repeat experiments. And they repeat other people's experiments. Because we tend to be a bit skeptical, us chemists. We, you know, somebody will publish a paper on something, and we're like, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder if that really works. And so we'll go try it ourselves. And so you get a lot of people testing the same hypothesis. And if, if it always passes the test, then it can become what's called a theory or a model. So an extensively tested hypothesis can become a theory. And the theory can be used to explain and predict future outcomes. What if your experiment proves that your hypothesis is not correct? Then what do you do? You go home? <laughs> no. You revise your hypothesis. You say, well, maybe Maybe I just need to tweak this aspect of it, okay, and I'm going to fix up my hypothesis to line up with this experiment that I just did, and I'm going to try it again and do another experiment. And so you tweak your hypothesis. Occasionally you realize, okay, that hypothesis was just a boatload of crap, right? It was just, you throw that out, start over again. But it, go, it can go around and around in circles for a while. And so the, the scientific method is an approach to study. 
an approach to learning about the universe around us. So here we have a graphic showing these different um, parts here. So the observation, um, natural phenomena and measured events. And if this is universally consistent, if this is observed in many, many different places at many times, that it may be stated as a law. So the observation in this example was milkmaids don't contract smallpox. Next comes the hypothesis, a tentative explanation. The hypothesis was because they already had gotten cowpox, they had some natural immunity to smallpox. So that's a hypothesis. Hypothesis is nice, but all by itself it doesn't do much. It needs to be tested. So we, we set out to test the hypothesis, and an experiment, in order to be meaningful, has to be very controlled. You, you have to control your variables and try to look at only one thing changing at a time. That's what makes um, human research or research into things relating to humans very difficult because you've got people's behavior, you've got their emotional state, you've got their genetics, you've got their diet, their exercise, all these different factors that you have to consider. And that's why you know, we look, try to look for the cause of heart disease and it becomes a very, very sticky problem to figure out. That's one of the reasons I like chemistry is because we have inanimate things, there's no living organisms, and so they're much easier to control. Even biology, you know, dealing with E. coli or something, they're alive. It's just too hard to, to deal with. So we test it. So the test was they intentionally exposed a healthy child to, to, to cowpox and then later to smallpox. Now, the hypothesis gets revised if the results of that experiment don't support it. And then you test it again. And so sometimes you go around in this circle. You can go around here for years as, as a career scientist. Um, once we come up with something that's standing the test of experiment, then that can become a model or a theory. A set of conceptual assumptions that explains the data from accumulated experiments and predicts related phenomena. So the model here is because the child did not contract smallpox, the immunity seemed to have resulted from the cowpox exposure. And then often there will be further experiment. We'll have more ideas, more hypothesis based on that model, and then those will be tested. And so if the further testing contradicts the model, then we go back and we alter the model. We update it. And so further testing here, um, they did, um, they inoculated a lot more humans with the cowpox virus and that, that confirmed the model, that the people who had gotten cowpox did not get smallpox. That led to a vaccination for, for smallpox and <clears throat> smallpox was later eradicated. I forget the dates, I read the chapter, it was like 79 or I don't know, it was a long time ago. The last known naturally occurring case of smallpox occurred. Nobody gets smallpox anymore and that's a really, really awesome thing. Any questions? <laughs>